Well, I was quite naive. I wanted to save the world. You know, I grew up in the time of acid rain, um, of lots of political instability, the Cold War, and I just had that sense I wanted to do my bit. And so I started physics because I thought, yeah, I want some technical solutions. I want to see something where I could contribute to these um, big challenges. I went uh, to the geophysics department because it seemed like a natural match from my physics background to introduce a little bit more science into my understanding. And um, it was a really small um, department. There were only two professors and they both, you know, were sort of a bit old, big beards. Um, and I had an appointment with one of them. I was quite nervous at the time, big professor, and I'm this little undergraduate. And I remember I came out so crushed from this discussion because I had so much enthusiasm. There was so much I wanted to do. And um, the feedback that I got was because I was a woman, um, clearly I would have some issues with the math that was required to do geophysics. And also whether I really wanted to invest that time um, having such a long um, study just to maybe drop out at the end to have a family. And I just couldn't even phantom that somebody would have such an opinion. And it left me quite, quite shocked, but also with a strong conviction that I did not want to study with this person, that I needed to find other mentors that actually would see the value of me being part of their team. So I went um, to other geo-type uh, <laughs> institutes and came across the Earth Science Institute and it was vibrant, there were lots of people, you know, people were keen to talk to you. You didn't need huge cues of an appointment to see a professor. You could just wander in through the door. It was a wonderful experience. And oh my God, was it um, such an interesting and fun time to study. So I went from, um, I first did my undergraduate and then did a master's. And while I did my master's working in Iceland, I read this really amazing news splits about some geological drilling that were, was conducted in Antarctica, led by a New Zealand team. And it was trying to understand whether Antarctica could become unstable in a warming world. And it just sounded so fascinating that I contacted the chief scientist, um, Professor Peter Barrett. And um, I called Peter invited me to call him to talk about the opportunity to maybe conduct a PhD with him. And he said, I'm still at Scott Base in Antarctica, give me a call. So I took all my nerves and I called Peter Barrett in Antarctica and I think um, the phone was op you know, answered by an operator. And I must have told this poor person my entire life story because I was so nervous just trying to explain why I was calling and that I was trying to talk to Peter Barrett. And so finally I got to talk to him and Peter said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Why don't we try that? And so I came and started to do a PhD with Peter that was um, related to that project. So what happened next was that I traveled to New Zealand and um, I became part of a team that had a long um, and distinguished history in taking marine sediment records from Antarctica. And it's the typical Kiwi thing. They were sort of world famous outside New Zealand, you know. Um, and I wanted, I didn't want to do marine sediment records. I wanted to do ice cores. And so ice cores is where you get a much higher resolution record. Um, and I thought it was quite complementary to the marine record. So I was this um, one ice core person, and I was also one of the only women at the time at the team. The first time I went to Antarctica was also already when I was in charge of the project, which was hugely scary. And it was really interesting because I went with a group of people who were quite experienced in the field. We boarded the plane in Christchurch and head down to Antarctica. And while I was sitting on the plane, I sort of looked around and I realized that there were only two other women on the entire plane and the rest of the plane was filled with men. But it really sort of became quite apparent when we had the safety instructions on the plane. And it was pointed out that at the back of the plane, there was a little curtain and behind the curtain was a metal bucket. And the metal bucket was to be used as a bathroom. Now that's a lot more easier for men than it is for women. So it was sort of the first introduction for me that I had to adjust a little bit too. <laughs> you know, um, that was over 20 years ago now um, and things have changed a little bit. So there's now a proper bathroom on the planes, but the most noticeable thing is possibly that half the plane are women now. And it's really impressive. You know, when you go to the bases and we, this New Zealand base is right next to the US base, McMurdo Station, you actually see um, sometimes tiny women driving these massive big um, operating vehicles, you know. And so it's wonderful to see that really um, this is one of the spaces where um, gender um, has no, no um, distinguishing factor anymore. 
Perhaps in the early days it was all about this sort of image of explorer and adventure and that you had to have sort of certain characteristics where you could swim through a cold river with a knife between your teeth. I don't think any of our <laughs> mentors have ever done this, nor have I. Um, but it became a lot more sophisticated that we really needed answers, uh, needed answers soon. The technology became a lot more important, skill sets became a lot more important. But of course, we also know that diverse teams just continuously and um, consistently outperform homogeneous teams, right? The, the more diverse your team is, the better it will be.